This lecture deals with the chi-square test. Uh, key topics include the chi-square test, uh, statistical independence, hypothesis test with the chi-square distribution, and limitations of the test. So what is the chi-square test? Well, it's an inferential statistic technique that's designed to test for significant relationships between two variables that are organized in a bivariate table. And it has a variety of applications in the social sciences. It requires no assumptions about the shape of the population distribution from which the sample is drawn, and can be applied to both nominal and ordinal variables. So why use the chi-square test? Well, relationships between variables found in bivariate tables typically are based on sample data. And we know that because of sampling error, sample statistics can differ from the true population values. And so therefore, we don't know if some relationship that we find in a, in, in a sample data table reflects the real association, that is the one found in the population, or is entirely due to, to random sampling fluctuations. And so we need some kind of a formal test to rule out uh, the difference between those two. Here's the intuition behind the chi-square statistic. The chi-square statistic measures the difference between observed frequencies in a bivariate table and those that are generated under the assumption that two variables are not associated with each other. In other words, that the two variables are independent. And so if, we, uh, if the observed and expected values are very close, the chi-square statistic tends to be small. And if the observed and expected frequencies tend to have a large discrepancy between each other, uh, the chi-square value is going to be large. And so a large chi-square value is more evidence that there's an association, uh, that is, that the two variables are not independent. So the chi-square statistic depends on the idea of statistical independence. And two variables are independent when their scores on one variable are not associated with the scores on the second variable. Independence in a bivariate table is basically found by comparing the distribution of the dependent variable across categories of the independent variable. Uh, if the two variables are independent, they should have identical distributions across the categories. And then if they're not, we should see some kind of a difference in the distribution across those categories. Let's consider the example of gender and attitudes towards abortion. Uh, suppose that we had some data on these two variables from the general social survey. And so we looked at the relationship between sex and, let's say, abortion for any reason. So this table basically shows the, the uh, bivariate percent and frequency distribution of the relationship between sex as an independent variable and attitude towards abortion as a dependent variable. And so notice that when we look at the column percentages here, we see that uh, there's a slight difference in the distribution of men and women who support and don't support abortion. Uh, it looks like, in fact, sli a slightly larger percentage of women favor abortion than do men. Uh, but the question is, how much of this relationship is due to, to sampling fluctuations? And so it appears that there's a relationship between gender and abortion, uh, at least one that holds in the sample. But does that relationship hold in the population, or is this just a matter of random sampling fluctuations? Uh, have we gotten just an unusual sample in which women seem to be more likely to support abortion than men? And so we can use the chi-square statistic to figure that out. So here are the steps involved in conducting the chi-square test. Uh, it has the same basic tests as any statistical test, including tests for, for averages or means. So we start by making assumptions, and then we state a hy our hypotheses and select an alpha level. And then we select the sampling distribution, compute a test statistic, and then make some kind of decision and interpret results. So let's examine each of these elements individually before looking at an example. First of all, uh, what are our assumptions? Well, we, ha we make no assumptions about the shape of the population distribution. And as usual, we assume that the data come from a random sample. And we assume that, that the variables that we're using in the analysis are measured on a nominal or ordinal, level, or ordinal variables, because those are the variables that, that are appropriate for bivariate tables. OK, so what, what does our hypotheses look like? Well, we start with a research hypothesis, H sub 1. And this proposes the two variables are basically related in the population. Our null hypothesis, H0 or H0, is that the variables are unrelated in the population. Uh, in other words, uh, H sub 0 says that there's no association between the two variables. Uh, note that this is the, the actual thing that's being tested in the, in the analysis. Uh, and so if we can basically disprove the null hypothesis, we have more evidence in favor of our research hypothesis that there is a, an association. Next, we have to pick a sampling distribution. Um, the chi-square test is basically obtained by comparing the actual frequencies to their observed frequencies. And so this test statistic follows a chi-square distribution. Here's the formula for the chi-square distribution. 
And so the, the uh, measure itself is designated by the Greek letter chi. It looks like an x squared. And that's a function of the actual observed frequencies that we get from the bivariate table, uh, f sub 0, and then f sub e, which is the expected frequencies that we have to calculate. Uh, these are the frequencies that we would expect to find if the two variables are completely unrelated to each other. And so the next slides will show how to calculate this value. And then what we do is we basically take the difference between the observed and expected frequencies and we square them. And then we divide them by the expected frequencies and then we add them or sum them across all the cells in the bivariate table. How do we calculate the expected frequencies? Well, we can use the following formula. And so that the formula tells us that, that f sub e is equal to the column marginal multiplied by the row marginal divided by the total number of cases. Uh, and basically, these frequencies uh, are exactly what we would find if the two variables are statistically independent. OK, let's get back to our example of sex and abortion. Uh, what would the table look like if, the, if these two variables were independent? Well, what we could do is basically we could calculate the expected frequencies, and then we can turn them into column percentages. And if we did that, we'd get a table that looks like this. And so here we can see that we have two variables. Uh, the, the distribution, basically, of attitudes towards abortion would be different across the values of male and female. I'm sorry, they would be the same. And so you can see that, that uh, in both cases, we have 44.39% of people who are in favor of abortion and 55.61% who are not in favor. And so again, we have identical distributions of the dependent variable within categories of the uh, independent variable. And so this would imply that, that the two um, uh, variables, sex and abortion, are independent if we were to find something like this. And so you can see that here, the same percent of men and women favor abortion, as do the, the same number of men and women who don't favor abortion. OK, so let's actually calculate the expected frequencies for our example of abortion and sex using the original observed frequencies in the table. And so that involves multiplying the row and column marginals and dividing the product by the total number of cases. So let's, start, uh, let's look at uh, one category. Uh, let's look at men who support abortion. And so notice that we would basically start by taking the row marginal, 554 cases, multiplying it by the column marginal, 555 cases, and dividing that by the total number of cases, in this case, 1,248 cases. And so when we do that, uh, we get our first expected frequency. Here I'm calling that F sub 1, 1, uh, which basically refers to the, the first row and first column. And so the expected cell frequency, would, if the two variables were independent, uh, for that cell would be 246.37. And so notice that we can do this for every cell. Uh, there's, there's four cells in our table because we have a two by two table. And so in this slide, I'm basically showing the expected frequencies for all the cells in the table. And so each of these cell uh, frequencies is subscripted with its uh, row number and column number. And you can see that in each case, I've taken the row marginal, multiply it by the column marginal, and divide it by the total number of cases. And then in each separate case, I've gotten the expected cell frequency. And so we have the 246.4 for the, for the uh, men who support abortion, 307.6 for uh, women who support abortion, and so on. And so uh, we can put them into an, a table of expected frequencies, and it would look something like this, right? So uh, men who support abortion, their expected frequency is 246.4. Women who support abortion, it's 307.6. And then we can fill in all the rest of the values. And so basically, if we took the column percentage in this case, uh, we would have an identical distribution of the values of abortion attitude across the values of sex, implying that there's, there's independence here. OK, so the table basically uh, displays our expected frequencies uh, along with the row and col column marginals. And again, if we took the percentages, uh, the percent difference across the, di the categories of sex would, would be 0. All right, let's, let's now calculate our test statistic. And that involves taking our calculated expectant frequencies and using them in the formula. And so again, the formula tells us to take the difference between f sub 0, the actual frequencies, minus f sub e, the expected frequencies, square them, divide them by f sub e, and then take the sum across all cells. And so here what I've done is I've basically rearranged the, the table a little bit so that each of the four cells makes up one column of the table. And so uh, this column basically shows f sub 0, the actual frequencies, uh, found in, in the original bivariate table. And so for men who support abortion, there's 243 of them. Men who don't support uh, include 312 men. 
there's 311 women who support, and then there's 382 women who don't support. And so uh, the next step is just basically for each of these to list the expected frequencies, uh, the ones that we calculated. So again, 246.4 uh, men, men don't, who support, uh, 307.6 women who support, and so on. Okay, so the first step in calculating the statistic is to take the difference between the observed and expected frequencies. And so let's start with men who support. We see that there's 243 of them. And if these two variables were independent, um, we would expect that there would be 246.4 of them. And so 243 minus 246.4 gives us a difference of negative 3.4. Uh, likewise, we do that for each of the different combinations, that is men who don't support, women who support, and women who don't support. And so that gives us, in each case, either 3.4 or negative 3.4. And so you can see if you add up the values in this column, uh, you get a value of zero. And that's true uh, generally, that's not true just in this case. And so because they sum to zero, we have to do something to exaggerate their difference. And so we're going to square them. And so taking the example of men who support abortion, negative 0.34 squared is going to give us 11.56. And so you can see that we, when we square each of them, we get the same value, 11.56. Uh, that's not generally true, but it is in this case because there's a small number of cases, a small number of, of, of uh, rows and columns. And so if we divide each of the square differences between observed and expected frequencies by the expected frequency, uh, that's, that's the next to last step in calculation. And so if we take our 11.56 for men who support and divide it by the expected frequency, 246.4, we get a value of 0 0.05. And we do the same thing for each of the different categories, uh, each of the different combinations of, of uh, sex and support for abortion attitude. The next step is basically to just take the sum of that last column. That is the sum of the difference between the observed and expected frequencies squared divided by the expected frequencies. And so we'll add together the 0 0.05, 0 0.04, 0 0.04, and 0 0.03 to get 0.15. And that's our chi-square statistic. And so um, what distribution does the chi-square statistic follow? Well, it, it turns out that it follows a chi-square distribution. And the chi-square distribution is basically a family of curves. Uh, each has a slightly different shape that's determined by its degrees of freedom. And so in a chi-square, uh, the range of the distribution is from zero, which means no association, to some kind of uh, unbounded positive value, uh, positive infinity. And so we, we calculate degrees of freedom for a chi-square distribution in the following way. We take the number of rows, r, and subtract 1, and we multiply that by the number of columns, c and minus 1. So df basically equals r minus 1 times c minus 1. In our example, we have a 2 by 2 table, 2 rows, 2 columns. And so our degrees of freedom are going to be equal to 2 minus 1, or 1, times 2 minus 1, or 1, which is just equal to 1. So we have 1 degree of freedom. Um, in order to understand intuitively the concept of degrees of freedom for a, a table, Imagine that we have one row and one column in the table fixed, and the others are free to vary. And so for a 2x2 two two table, we have one column and row, one row fixed, as shown in, in the uh, diagram below. And that means that we only have one cell that's free to vary, and that's our one degree of freedom. Okay, the next uh, slide basically shows a figure that has chi-square distributions for ver various degrees of freedom. Uh, notice that each has a positively skewed distribution, especially at smaller degrees of freedom. But there's a tendency uh, for the chi-square distribution to, to resemble more and more a normal distribution as the degrees of freedom gets get larger. And so here we have a, a diagram that shows uh, chi-square distributions for 2, 4, 6, and 8 degrees of freedom. Uh, you can see that the one for 2 degrees of freedom uh, doesn't look like much of a, a curve at all. Uh, for four, it starts to kind of t look like more of a, a positively skewed distribution. And as we increase up to, up to six and eight degrees of freedom, it's starting to look more and more like a normal distribution. And so now we have to make a decision. We have to compare our chi-square test statistic, the one that we calculated in our, our example, 0 0.15, to some kind of critical value under the null hypothesis. And so we find the critical value by looking at a chi-square table that lists different critical values for common alpha levels by degrees of freedom. And so here's a portion of the chi-square table. Uh, notice that it has uh, a column for degrees of freedom, and then it also has a column uh, of uh, different p-values. And so we need to figure out the, the degrees of freedom and the proper alpha level to use to find our, our critical value. And so um, in our example, we only have one degree of freedom, so we'll look here. And then let's use a conventional 0.05 alpha level. 
And so that means that uh, we have 3.84 as our critical value. And so we're going to compare this value to our test statistic. And so we're looking for a test statistic that's bigger than this critical value in order to reject the null hypothesis. And then if our critical value is going to be bigger than our test statistic, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. And so our test statistic, 0.15, is less than our critical value, 3.84. And so in this case, we fail to re reject the null hypothesis. Therefore, we can't conclude that there's any kind of association between the variables in the population. We have no evidence for our research hypothesis that the two are associated. Now let's talk about some of the limitations of the chi-squared test. So although the chi-squared test can tell us something about statistical significance, it really doesn't tell us anything about the strength or the substantive significance of a relationship in the population. So just be think, because two, two variables are associated doesn't mean that they have a strong association. It just means that they don't happen by chance. So it doesn't tell us anything about the relationship's theoretical importance or even if it's worth investigating. Uh, we could have a weak or a strong chi-square test, um, and it only tells us that the population that, that the relationship holds in the population, not whether it's a, a weak or strong relationship. Some of the major limitations of the chi-square statistic includes its sensitivity to sample size. So the size of the chi-square statistic is always proportional to the size of the sample, no matter the strength of the relationship of the variables. So for example, if we cut the frequencies in every cell in half, which is equivalent to reducing the sample size in half, the chi-square statistic would correspondingly be cut in half. And so uh, unfortunately, the change would not affect the percent distribution. Therefore, the, the size of the percentage difference in the strength of the association between um, the variables would remain. And so the sensitivity of the chi-square test to sample size means that even a relatively strong association between the variables may not be significant when the size is small. And so uh, a large sample in general is more likely to result in a significant chi-square statistic, and a smaller sample uh, basically is less likely to be significant. Another limitation of the chi-square test is its sensitivity to small expected frequencies. If one or more of the expected frequencies is below 5, the chi-square statistic is going to be unstable, leading to erroneous conclusions. And so most researchers basically limit uh, the use of chi-square table uh, to only those circumstances where one of the following is true, or both of the following are true. That, that is, there's no expected values that are below 5, and um, there's no more than 20% of expected values that are below 5. 